Okay. Space on the left side. Space on the right. All right, you're rolling. Good to go. Okay. All right, everybody. Ears, eyes, up for me. So we have four class sessions for our time in Cab Luther. I know it's fun to play games and everything else. But please, when we have our class sessions together, make sure you're paying attention. And make sure we're paying attention, right? Okay. So let's go ahead and open the word of prayer first. Dear God, we give you thanks for uh, today and for the opportunity to come to Camp Luther to have fun, to make friendships, uh, and to learn about you. Help this, this time together in learning of your commandments, uh, your will for our life. Help it to be uh, fruitful. Help it to be fun. And help it, help it to allow us to, uh, to grow closer to you as, as, as you are our God. Also, we ask in your son's name. Amen. All right, so you're going to notice in front of you, you got a big binder. Open up that big binder. It's open. Open up. There we go. Pat that first page. You have a whole bunch of worksheets. We kind of changed it up from last year and the years prior for confirmation. You have in that binder all the worksheets for the entire first semester. Everything. Don't lose your binder. <laughs> that is yours to keep. You're going to bring it home with you. You're going to keep it with you. Don't lose it, because if you lose it, then we got to replace it, and you're not going to have your notes and everything else. Make sure you keep your binder. Okay, at the front of your binder, you got those worksheets. Now, flip to the back of your binder. You should see some pages that look familiar. Worship reports are also in there. Did everybody see them? At the back of your binder, see back. Did you also do this? All the way back. Hey, did everybody find their worship notes in the back of the binder? Yes. Okay, same thing. Keep them in here. You can open up the binder. You can grab your worksheet if you want. Bring it to church, fill it out. But make sure your worship notes stay in here. I love collecting papers from you guys, but I really don't want to collect uh, nine times, who's going to have like 145 worship notes? It fills the whole drawer. I don't really want to do it. So keep them in here. I'll grade them. Then you can get them back. And it also cuts down these questions when all of you come into my office and are like, how many have I done? Even though you can do infinite. Now you'll just know. They'll be in there. You can flip and be like, I've done six. I got three more to do. So should you keep your worship notes in your binder? Yes. Yes? Perfect. That is my whole spiel for the changes that we have had. Now flip back to the front. We're going to start our, our first lesson. Should say Unit 1, Lesson 1, Law and Gospel. Did we find it? This table found it? Good. Table over here. Did you guys find it? Good to go. Good to go. Perfect. Okay, before we get even to the first question, I wish I had put it on this worksheet, but I didn't. I'm going to ask it anyway, because it's important for you guys to think about now and over the next two years. Why are you in confirmation? I asked our eighth graders this last year this question before they were confirmed. Why are you here? Why are you doing this? Good, so to grow in faith. We're going to talk about getting confirmed. I'm, here's my soapbox. I don't like getting confirmed, but I'll tell you why later. Why else are you here? So, so we know how to continue your faith in Jesus. Continue your faith in Jesus? Nice. Yep. That would mean, like, tell others about Yep, tell others. Yep. To bring you closer to God. Nice. Okay, anybody else? All right, you guys gave me all the really, really good answers. Now... Over the next two years, I would like to admit, think that you're all going to be paying attention really well so you can do all those things. But, truthfully, you might get distracted, you might start talking and everything else during our class sessions. Then I'm going to have to ask you again, why are you here? And later, some of the answers you might give me are, well, because mom and dad said I need to be here. Or because my siblings got here. The reason I hope you are here is for the good reasons of, I want to 
to know about my faith. I want to share my faith. I want to grow closer to God. Make sure those are the reasons. Because ultimately, at the end of all this, when you guys are at the point of, as you said, getting confirmed, I'm going to ask the question again. And if you come up and you're like, I don't know why I'm doing it, but my parents said I should, I'm going to say, that's, that's not a great reason. You, you, are you understanding this? I hope that when Pastor Dave and I stand in front of the church with you guys, that you'll be really excited to stand in front of everybody else and say, yes, I believe this. I want to be a part of this church. Don't say those things if you don't mean them. Make sense? So when you come here, want to come here. Let's want to learn about God, learn about our faith, share all those things. Now we're going to have bad days. I'll have days where I'm like, I don't know, I'm tired and don't want to be here either. But we'll all come. We'll try our best to be happy about being here. Make sense? Okay, now Levi, you're the one who set it off. The getting confirmed. I prefer the idea that you guys are going to be confirming your faith. Can anybody tell me what the difference is? Between saying, I'm going to go get confirmed, or I'm going to confirm my faith. Yeah, versus, but if you say you're getting confirmed, what are you, what? what? Yeah, if you say you're getting confirmed, it's like you can just step up to the front. Oh, I don't want to be here, Pastor Dave, and I say, oh, you're confirmed, and it's done. Instead, I want you all to think, I'm going to confirm my faith in two years. I'm going to stand in front of the church, and I'm going to get to say, I believe all this stuff. I want to be a part of this community, and I'm excited. Make sense? Now we can actually start the lesson. Now that I give you guys the whole spiel. So the first question you got on there. <clears throat> What's one thing that's unique about Christianity? <coughs> What's one thing you think that's unique about Christianity? Um, we go off the Bible itself. Okay, so we got the Bible. Well, there's, there's other religions that have other books. Good. So we stand firm that the Bible is what it says it is. There's an actual end, like not actual end, but an actual end destination. Give me more. Like heaven, hell. There's okay. An actual end destination. Sure. Again, some other religions they'll say that there's other places you might go. What about Christianity? I like it. Scripture is important because we have this book that tells us everything, and unlike other religions, we believe this is a living word from God. He sent it to us. He gave it to us. That's how He speaks to us today. What else? When Pastor Dave and I get up front and we preach, do we tell you guys like you got to make sure you do X, Y, and Z in order to get into heaven? Usually, what's our big push? The, the thing that makes you feel good? To ask God for forgiveness. Oh, so to ask God for forgiveness, we, we tell you that you can be forgiven. What else? Yeah, that you have to have faith because somebody already did it. So that's one of the huge, huge, huge unique things of Christianity. A lot of other religions out there. And they say, make sure you live your life according to these tenets if you want to have any chance of getting to salvation or whatever the end point is. You were saying, the end point. When it comes to Christianity, that's not the case. Now, there are, we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments. Does God want you to live your life according to a certain idea, or does he want you to live a good life according to his will? Yeah. But is that ultimately what's going to get you into heaven? What gets you into heaven? Faith and what else? Somebody had to do something. Jesus had to come and die. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, man. The big push, the big change, the big difference. Other religions, it's all about me. It's all about how I'm going to get to a certain point. How am I going to get to heaven? How am I going to be redeemed? Christianity is all about the fact that God already did it. He already came. Jesus came, lived life. He did the thing that needed to be done. He even gives us faith. We believe that we are given faith. 
We just gotta believe. Make sense? Does that offer you comfort? Not? Does it make you feel confused, anxious? You know, is that a comforting idea or not? Why? <clears throat> so that you know that we can trust our God and He forgives us for all of our sin we did this <coughs> and not judge us on what we should have done. Nice. So we know that we can be so we can trust in God because He has done all these things for us. What else? I'll show you with your mind. Anybody here think they're perfect? I don't think I would like it very much if I was told that my perfection was how I was going to get into heaven. That feels like it'd be a little bit of a weight on the shoulders, wouldn't it? So to find out that not only somebody, but the Son of God, our triune God, took care of those things for us, that gives me comfort. And that is a good reason why I wanted to confirm my faith why I hope you would too. That's part of why Christianity is unique. <clears throat> so one thing about God that's unique is that God is what? I already said the word. Oh, sorry, I got the wrong answer in here. Uh, he's what? I said it before. I didn't say the word, but I said this before. Yeah. Triune. So he is triune. That's not quite the answer, though. He is something else. Forgiving. He is forgiving. We can write down all these words. They're good words for him. What else is God? Give you a hint. Did God create the whole world and then step back and be like, all right, figure it out. <coughs> what does he do? He's, well, he's helping, and he helps in a very important, particular way. What are the books you guys have in front of you? Which is? The Bible is? It's holy. It's something that lives. It's his word. We have a God that speaks. We have a speaking God. That is also unique for us. Christianity is one religion that has God's word. We believe that the Bible is his spoken word to us through his prophets, through his disciples. God speaks to us. Make sure you guys are taking notes, too. Yep. Oh. Anybody else need pencil? Over here. <laughs> Alright, so we know that God is a speaking God. And he speaks to us in two ways. What do you think that is? The Bible. Oh. So he does speak to us in the Bible. That's the main way, but it's not one of these two ways that we're talking about. That's kind of like overarching. And within the Bible, it's broken up into two kind of important things. Prayer? Well, we speak to God in prayer. Well, so he did speak through the prophets. So I guess maybe a better way to say this is what are the two messages that he speaks to us? Same thing that we do in church, too. No, so again, we kind of, we talk to God in prayer. Scriptures? So we have the scriptures, it's the living word. Uh, I'll say that for now. Two things that we do in church. First off, we come in, one of the first things we do at the service, we go up, or we don't all go up, but we say to God that we are sinful. How do we know that? Because it's one of the ways. So one of the ways God speaks to us is through the law. God's law tells us that we are sinful. Nice. And if the law is one, what do you think the other one would be? Gospel. Long gospel. We are a law and gospel religion. You guys were all right on it. Law and gospel. <clears throat> I think we did this, well, those of you who were in seventh grade last year, we did these two SOSs, or maybe even in eighth grade, you guys have done it. What's the SOS of the law? It's a handy dandy little way of remembering this. 
law SOS is it anybody? What is the law all about? So the law probably shows, there we go, SOS, shows our sins. Yes! <clears throat> and if the law shows us our sins, what do you think the gospel does? Another SOS. <coughs> I'll give you a hint, the first two, S, the first two letters are the same thing. Not our strength, because we're still pretty weak. Shows our Savior? Bingo. The gospel shows our Savior. This might even help you with your worship notes, because in your worship notes you have to point out the law and gospel when we preach, right? When Pastor Dave and I give a sermon, one of the questions we ask is, well, what was the law? How, how was the law used? When we use the law generally... We're pointing out some sort of sin. Either it's my sinfulness or it's sinfulness in the world. And when we say, well, it's the gospel, it's, well, how did Jesus take care of that issue? How does God take care of that issue? How is sin answered? Some way through what God did for us. Make sense? Any questions so far? No? All making sense? Yeah. Shows our sin. All right, y'all, we're going to get to open up that Bible. <coughs> we are in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Somebody's going to read it for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Perfect. Did it sound like there was law and gospel in there? Did everybody get there? Are we still? No. We'll read it again once everybody's there. Romans 6, verse 23. Today, would you mind reading? <coughs> Alright, everybody listen and follow along for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Alright, we'll be done with the law in that, in that verse. We got a good law and gospel right here. Short and sweet. Death. Death. The wages of sin is death. Where does that leave you feeling if I were to end the verse right there? If I just walked into this classroom and I was like, the wages of sin and death are death. 
period, MLM. How do you think you guys are feeling right now? Probably less hopeful. I don't, either you'd be really eager for me to come back, or you'd leave and be like, well, I'm not going to listen to that crack ever again. Right? It'd be leaving you pretty low. Now, what's the gospel? Eternal life. Eternal life? What, what, what is the chapter of the verse? Um, in Christ Jesus. Nice. It gives us the gospel, short and sweet. Jesus Christ gives eternal life. Our law? In sin, we're dead. Gospel? In Christ, we're given eternal life. Make sense? Any questions? Is this making sense? This is going to be really important once we get into the Ten Commandments. The commandments are all about actions, but we're also going to be talking about how Christ works in our lives, why it is that we should follow these things. <coughs> all right, everybody got it? Read it one more time. Oh, yeah. So law in part <coughs> for verse 23 is, uh, let's see, let's make sure I find it again. The wage of sin is death. So in sin, we're made dead. In the gospel part, in Christ, we're given eternal life. That sounded like law. It was me. law. You don't get any gospel. That was law. <laughs> All right. <coughs> now we're just going to break down law and gospel. Why do we need both? First off, why do we need law? Why do you guys think that we need to have why do why is it included in the services? Why is it in the Bible? You had your hand first. Um, to know what not to do. To know what not to do? Yeah. What else? To show we are sinful. To show we are sinful. Why would you come to church if you didn't think you had any reason, right? If I told you guys were perfect and you had everything figured out and alone you were going to get into heaven and everything's going to be hunky-dory, you think you'd come to church? I mean, not. That'd say you'd, you'd be like, well, I got it all figured out. I don't really need you anymore. <clears throat> the law shows us that we are in need. Why do we need the gospel? Try and give it to these other tables. Girls, in fact, do you guys have any guesses? Why might we need the gospel? <clears throat> Up front, any answers? Why we might need the gospel? Yeah, to show us that we are forgiven, that there is hope. So that's going to basically, the best way that I can explain this to y'all is that this falls on sort of a spectrum, if you will. So we're talking about law and gospel, right? Just for today, imagine that the law is over here and the gospel over here, okay? Make sense? Law over here, gospel over here. If I stand holy right here, just in the law, what do you think my life's going to look like? Oh, really strict, but what else? If all I'm reading from the Bible is that first bit of law from uh, our verse, what's my life going to look like? Really dark, kind of bad. Yeah. What do you think my outlook on the rest of my life, and not only the rest of my life, but what comes after life, what do you think the outlook's going to be for me? Pretty bleak. Do you think I'm going to want to get out of bed? Why would I? Right? If I didn't have any sort of gospel, why would I bother getting out of bed or trying to do anything? Because all I'm being told is that I'm a really bad person, I've made a mistakes, and there's no hope for me, right? So that's one way that I could go too far. The other one is, if all I'm getting is the law, do you think I'm going to care about being a good person? 
No. If I have no hope of salvation, I think I'm probably just going to throw all God in the wind and say, whatever I want is what I'm going to do. Is this a good place to be? Okay, well, then the obvious answer, right, is to go all the way over here. This is a great place to be, right? Holy in the gospel, nothing else. Is this right? Yes. Oh, we got some time. I got a whole lot of yeses over here and a whole, a whole lot of noes over here. Why do you think yes? Say what? Okay, so I would know God. I would know everything he's going to do for me. Any, any more defense for why this is the right place to be right here? All right. Why do you guys think it wouldn't be a great place to be? Because I feel like that it's showing that we haven't seen that we're going to, or we're, we're just going to get the darkness. I feel like being in the middle would be the best because then you can see that like what you did, how you sinned, what you did, but we also get the gospel to show that we are forgiven and we are, there is life, there is eternal life for after everything. Holy right here, and I never have the law, then all I'm going to think is, boy, I've got it all figured out. And I don't need to worry about <coughs> church or the Bible or anything else because I've got it. And I know that Jesus died for my sins, so do I really need to worry about my sins at all because he's just going to pay for them anyway? Do you think that would be a dangerous way to think? Yeah. Why? Why would it be dangerous if I'm just like, ah, oh, he'll pay for all the sins anyway? Because it doesn't, you don't just have to be believing that you can be cleansed of your sins. You have to be asking for Well, so we do, we think, you know, faith is a key thing. I, I like that you have it, and that you should be asking, we should be repentant. We believe that we come, we should repent of our sins. But also, am I going to care how I should be living my life? Why would I? Right? Imagine if you wanted, I don't know, candy, all the candy in the world, and I just kept giving you money. And you could just go buy as much as you want. Do you think you're ever going to worry about the cost of the candy or anything else like that? Why? Because you're just going to keep coming back to me. And you're going to tell me to keep coughing it up, and I'm just going to keep giving it to you. You're not going to be worried about anything. So we want to end up somewhere right here. Why? Why is this where the Christian lives? Somewhere in between the two. Girls in the back, yeah, any guesses, any answers? <clears throat> no? Sorry. I mean, Levi explained this one perfectly. If you have the law to show you have sin, in the gospel to show that you're forgiven for the sin. Nice. Yes, if we have the law, it shows us that we have sin. The gospel shows us that we are forgiven for the sins. Yeah. We've got to have it in order to be forgiven of it. Say what? So we have to have sin to be forgiven of it, and we also have to see it. Well, it'd be great if we didn't have sin, but I think the more important thing is that it shows us that it's there, right? we got to be shown that we are sinful, and then we got to be shown that we are forgiven. Those sins are taken away. You gotta kinda of find yourself in the middle. And that's always how life is. Who made a mistake this week? Well, I've been there we go. So you probably got a little bit of a taste of this. Boy, I really wish I hadn't done that, right? Anybody feel guilty for the mistake they made this week? There we go. You were right over here. I feel really bad for that. And then you know what you get to do? Come over here. And you just say, boy, I'm really sorry for that thing I did. And then God says, you know what? I forgive you for that. I sent my son, he died for those sins, that one's forgiven. And then where do you fall in? Right back here. Always going to both sides, always different on both sides. Make sense? Any questions? I know we're just powering along, so if you do have any questions, please stop me. Boys, any questions here? Girls, any questions in the back? I'll make it sense. Boys in the back? 
the stable up here, you're mixed, I can't say. Any questions? Okay. All right, you're gonna notice they have on there three different distinctions for law. This might seem a little like why do we need to talk about it, but it is still important because we just got done saying that the law does some important stuff for us. <clears throat> the law has three uses. The first one is the curb. What do you guys imagine curbs? <coughs> we just got done driving all the way to Beach, uh, Camp Luther. What does a curb do? The law is a curb. What do you imagine? Like, stop wheels from going? Kind of. It takes us around something. Takes us, uh, I don't know who takes us around something. What does a, imagine a road? What does a curb do? Keeps us on the road. Keeps us on the road. Keeps us going forward. It keeps us on the right path. When I'm driving my car, if I... This is a bad analogy, but I'm going to go for it. If I fall asleep while I'm driving my car, and I'm going, and all of a sudden it starts to veer a little bit, and I hit that curb, do you think I'm going to get jolted awake? Probably. There we go. That is the law of the curb. It guides us, and it also shows us that punishment. It gives us that jerk. Wakes us up. Make sense? So for that first one, law as curb. What I want you to have on there. Keeps you on the right path. Shows punishment for sin. Alright, next up, we have we have the law as the mirror. Do you guys need a pen over here? Do you need one? I can give you one, we got one. Alright, law as the mirror. What's a mirror do? <coughs> it reflects. So the mirror lies to you. When you go in the morning and you are doing your hair or making sure you got that swoop perfect. Is it going to lie to you to make you feel better? What's it going to show you? Well, it's going to show you what's wrong. That's our answer, but overall the mirror is going to show you what's there, right? You look in the mirror, it's going to show you exactly who you are. It's going to show you your hair whether you like it or not. It's going to show you your face features whether you like it or not. It's going to show you everything that is there. The law as the mirror shows us our sin. It just shows us what's there. God's law doesn't pull any punches, guys. That's why people always cringe when we say we're going to talk about the law, because they're like, he's going to tell me about how I'm bad. No, the truth is, that's kind of what the law does, because it shows us where God wanted us to go, and then it tells us, oh, you're kind of over here. It shows us where we're getting it wrong. It shows us what's actually there. And then the law as the guide. Um, he says you should have said the truth. Kind of. Kind of. Yeah. So I, I think the way. Helps you make the right decisions. Helps you to make the right decisions. The way I kind of envision this anybody use like a trail map to go hiking? Yes. yes. Right? There's no curves, there's not really not a lot of signs usually, but you got your map. God's word does that for us, his law does that. It tells you where you should go. God's law guides us on the path we should go. Alright, the last point, we want life to be about us. Anybody here kind of think they're the main character of their story? I'm willing to admit that sometimes I fall into that one. Really? Only that? Who here has had the idea that they're kind of the main character of their story? Yes. Yeah. We watch movies, we watch television, it's all about one person, right? You guys watch all these shows that have just one person as focus, and it's their world, and other people are living in it, and they're interacting with it, but ultimately it's the story of this one person. And sometimes it's easy for us to think, well, this is my world, and you guys are all just living in it for us. 
It can be easy to feel like it's our world, or it's my world, and you guys are all living in it. But the truth is, whose world is this? It's God's world. Whose story is it? It's God's story. We just get to be a part of it. All right, we're going to watch a video here in just one second, but do we have <coughs> any questions up until this point? Anything that's clarifying? Anything didn't make sense? We good? Okay. It's not about you. Billions of people have come before you, and once you are in the ground, billions more will come after you. This life, this, this gathering, this, this story, it involves you, it will bless you, and at times it will burden you, it will employ you. Listen to me. It is not about you. Now here's the thing though. Uh, tonight we've heard about how our life is a story. And we're gonna kind of roll with that metaphor. And one of the things we have to understand is that, is that our lives, our stories do ultimately have to be about <coughs> something. And every story is about something. Uh, of mice and men was about pursuing a dream. But twilight. That's about what I expected. It was good. Twilight was about the, um, the power of love in a world of emo vampires, right? <laughs> My daughter is, is four years old, and she has a stack of uh, Dora books, and they're all like, they're like painfully similar. Dora goes on an adventure, and Dora gets lost. But even her stories are about something. Dora's stories are about exploring. That's right. Now, how about something? I I've always wondered this. Where are Dora's parents? I mean, seriously. She's like five years old and wandering in the woods. And the whole point of her show is to ask my daughter for help. You're thinking, well, don't ask her. She can't find the bathroom half the time. Text your mom, Nora. Hook up with that Diego dude. He seems to know what he's doing. Right? But listen to me. Every story is ultimately about something. And the biggest mistake that people make, uh, the biggest trap that we constantly get caught in, is thinking that our story is actually about us. But listen to me. You have been sold a lie. A lie that says you are not only the star of your story, but you are the hero of this whole thing. It's a lie that comes to you from good people, from well-meaning people, People who tell you to, to follow your heart, reach for the stars, try your best, and whatever, whatever happy ending that you're aiming for will ultimately be yours. And we buy it, right? I mean, maybe you're here and you are living like the sports star story. Life is all about what you can accomplish on the court and the popularity you're trying to build on the field. Off the field. Or maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum and, and you're living the, the reach end story. Where life is all about 
all about how you are misunderstood and made fun of at school. Listen to me, it's still all about you, and in your head, it's all about how you're going to be awesome one day and show us how great you are. Or maybe, maybe you're living the boy crazy story. You're like, you've been here three days, you've already texted your boyfriend like 1,300 times. Oh, gee. The gallery is awesome, but I missed you so much. <laughs> You're my best friend. Or maybe you sold out to that romance story. If you're a guy or you're a girl, you're dreaming about that special person you can ride off into the sunset of the Taylor Swift song playing in the back of your mind, right? <laughs> yeah, I knew I did for that one. But here's the catch. Listen to me. Here's the thing the people that tell you that lie don't want you to know. If you are the star of your story, if you're the hero of the story, then listen to me. That means it is all on you in that story. And you better hope that you can deliver. Because if you can't, it's all been a waste. Because if you're the hero, if you're the star, it's all on you. And you gotta do it. Now, now this is why I love the story of the woman at the well. Uh, in this story, uh, God shows us what living as if you're the star of the show will ultimately get you. John chapter 4, starting at verse 7. Listen to these words. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Uh, we learn later from Jesus that this woman had five men in her life, and she was working on six. You can imagine that she was the kind of girl who, who would pour herself into one guy, only to end up in the arms of another guy. Maybe, maybe one of the men like, like shouted her in gifts and money, and it made her feel secure. And maybe, maybe the other guy was constantly telling her how hot she was and how great she was, and it made her feel wanted. I don't know, but that is the woman who went to the well. And why do you think she went there? I mean, John tells us that it was noon, the, the hottest part of the desert day. Not only that, but in her culture, it was rare. I, I mean, like, rare for a woman to talk to a man who's not her husband outside of her home. And yet she went to the well. Why do you think she went? Because she was thirsty? You need to watch a little more TV. She went to the well in the middle of the day. She saw a strange man off in the distance, and she decides to keep walking even though she knows she shouldn't. Why did she do that? She did that because of the messed up movie that's playing in her mind where she is the star of the show and the hero of her own happiness. That guy might be another guy that she can wink at, flirt with, fall for. That guy might be another guy that can get her like one step closer to the happy ending that she's been so desperately chasing. And so when this strange man is sitting there and he says, give me a drink, there's something inside her that says, yes, sir. And yet what you and I know is that even after all that effort, she still felt as empty inside as the jar in her hands. And Jesus knows this. And so as she approaches, he speaks to her. Listen to these words. This is Jesus. Everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Do you catch what Jesus is saying? Jesus says, if all you ever do is drink from the wells of this world, trying desperately to succeed, trying desperately to have a good story, you will die thirsty. Because only I, Jesus says, only I have the well that never runs dry. Only I have the water that is seriously satisfied. 
Jesus interrupts the life of this woman and he confronts her with the truth that the story she's been living leaves her empty for a reason. Because her life is not supposed to be about her. Her life, your life, was meant from the beginning of time to be about him. The biggest mistake people make is thinking that their existence, their story, is all about them. But your story is about Jesus. That's who it's about. And there is a temptation, even as I say those words, to hear that as a bad thing. Don't tell me who my story is about. My story is not me. No, it isn't. Look it up. It's about me. And do not hear that as a bad thing. Hear that as an incredible, wonderful, crazy, amazing thing. Listen to me. When Jesus is the star of the story, there is forgiveness for every freaky little thing that you have ever done. And I have been here all week long, and I know you have been doing some freaky things. When Jesus is the star of the story, no matter how bad you have been, you are good with God. When Jesus is the star of the story, you, you do not, listen to me, you do not have to wander around in this world in doubt, but you can be led confidently by his word. When Jesus is the star of the story, there is no fear of sin, no fear of death, because they have been kicked in the teeth by the blood of the cross and the emptiness of the tomb. And because you, my friends, you have you have drank from that well because you have been baptized into his name. Every single one of those promises, all of them, they are true for you tonight. Jesus is the star of your story. Now you might say, Matt, that's an excellent observation. <laughs> but why, Matt, do you bring all this up? Well, Matt, if you've got any friends, let me share this with you. The reason I bring all this up is simple. You came here this week. You came here this week serving two stories. And when I say you, I'm not just talking to my friends who are students, I'm talking to the church professionals, the youth leaders, the pastors, I'm talking to myself. You came here this week serving two stories. One that is all about you, and one that is about Jesus. No more. Throughout your life, there are going to be certain certain well moments, certain wake-up call moments of your own, where, where through success, through struggle, uh, through good things and bad, God interrupts your life and, and he grabs a hold of you and, and he reminds you who this whole thing is actually all about. And through those good things, through those bad things, and everything, his whole purpose is to get your attention back and say, hey, 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 come here, come here. It's all about Jesus. It's not about you. He's going to use all those things, those wake-up calls, well moments to draw you back to the person and the work and the promises of Jesus Christ. One of those moments came for me when I was 19 years old. I got a phone call. Uh, the friend of mine named Josh had had a heart attack, 19 years old. And, and so I went up to the hospital, and, and it, was, it was crazy. Uh, this is a kid that, that, that I went to Sunday school with, that, that I graduated with, that I, that I went to the National Youth Gathering with. And, and, and he was laying there. He, he was laying there on, on, on life support. 
And so I, I go to this room, and immediately I, I hug his mom, and I hug his dad, and, and then I kneel down next to the bed and start to pray, Heavenly Father, heal my friend, Heavenly Father, save my friend. And, and then all of this, I, I, I can hear these voices, the, the, these voices of people coming down the hall, and you can just kind of tell that they were about to enter that room. And, and I recognize these voices as the voices of people that I had gone to school with. Now, now, something you need to know about me is that, is that at the time I was one of those kids who, who kept this church thing and, and, and the rest of his life kind of separate. I, I was serving one story on Sunday and, and a different story uh, on Monday. And honestly, I really liked it that way. I, I liked having two separate stories living as if there were two different stars of the show. And I worked hard to keep it that way. There were few people in my circle, in my life, who knew that I loved Jesus, and that was fine with me. And yet I hear these voices coming down the hall, and these people who knew me as one guy all of a sudden are going to see me as, as praying and pleading and crying guy. And this may sound like, like stupid and superficial to you, but for me, at that moment, it was, it was a big crisis, and the only thing that I could think of, the only thing I could think of in that moment was, I have to stop praying. I have to stop, I have to stand up, I have to take one step back. And it's crazy how certain moments get etched into your memory. I stood up, facing the bed, and to my right was the sound of a ventilator pumping my friend's lungs. And then to my left, right here, was, was Josh's dad, and I heard him say, I don't want to lose my baby. And behind me were these voices of, of, of mourning and crying friends coming down the hall, and the only thing that, that this kid could think of was that I had to stop praying to the God of the universe to save my friend so I could salvage some piece of my stupid reputation. And, and in that moment, it, it hit me. I cared more about myself than I did about my friend. Listen to me on this. I had more belief in my own stardom than in the Savior of the world. I was balancing two stories, and I saw how ugly and evil and selfish that was. And I knew it had to stop. You see, the real star of the show had long ago already forgiven my friend. Uh, the real star promised my friend an eternity in God's family. The real star one day will resurrect his now dead body and reunite us all. And the wannabe in the room wasn't even willing to pray. And in that moment, God was, God was doing a whole bunch of stuff, but he was working in my story to, to remind me, to awaken me to who this whole thing really needed to be about, and it wasn't me. So here's my question for you. What's going on in your life? Now let me put it like this. What is God doing in your story? There are certain wake-up call, well moments in your life, and if you haven't figured it out yet, this week is supposed to be one of them. Maybe this week you realize that you are stuck in some sin, and it's time for you to step back, turn away, and walk to Jesus. Listen to me. Listen to me. There is a boy you've gone too far with. There is a girl you have touched who does not belong to you. There is a secret that you are hiding and keeping from 
others, and you're trying to squelch it and put it into the dark, but it has to come into the light. It has to come into the light, and this week you realize it. Or maybe you realize that all the crazy stuff that is going on in your family life at home is actually affecting you, and you need to talk to somebody. Or maybe the light bulb has come on, and, and you realize that, that the loneliness you're living with has kind of reached a boil inside of your heart, and you can't live as if you don't need anybody anymore. Or maybe it's hit you this week while you're here in some way that, that, that your heart, your, your ego is massive. That the most important thing in your life is how many people give a thumbs up to your Facebook status. Who cares? Life doesn't need a like button. It needs a what does this matter button. That's what it needs, right? Whatever it is that is happening in your life, in your story right now, whatever it is, good, bad, otherwise, listen to me on this. God is using it. He is using it to remind you now, to awaken you now, to wake you up now of who this whole thing is actually about. Look, as a pastor, I get, I get to visit with people at all different stages of their life. And here's the really sad thing that I get to see, is that most people don't have that light bulb moment where they realize what life is actually about until they are at their end of their life. And they look at me, or they look at their family, and they say, man, I wish I knew then what I know now. All right. Let's sit out. <clears throat> Anything stand out in that video? Anything at all? Yeah. Why do you think I played that video for the first class of confirmation? Because it went along well with our theme of being sinful and being forgiven by God. Nice. What else? Even more so. Something deeper here. What did I ask you at the very beginning of class? This whole class has been basically Christianity broken down to the very simplest forms. But what did I say at the beginning? Say what? Say what? I hope it takes a while. Why are you here? Why are you here? That's why I played this video. I know. I When I started as a pastor last year, I was like, this is going to be great because I'm still young and I know everything that's happening. But it, you guys have made it abundantly clear during dinner that I have no idea what kind of lingo is being said or, or yes, the thing that you're watching. There is some separation, but the reason that Pastor Dave and I are here and the reason that we hope that you are here, there's, there's deeper meaning going on. I don't know what you guys are facing. I don't know what's popular in the world today. But I do know that we all tend to fall into this idea that we are the main character of the story. And I hope that when you come here, you start to see that there is something more important going on. And that you don't have to be the main character of your story. Did you like what he said about how it can be free not to be the main character? Right? I don't know about you, but I like that. And I hope you did too. And that's what Christianity is about. I know it's a hard pill to swallow. It took like the first time I watched this, I was shocked when he said, This isn't your story. What do you mean? But it's not. We get to be invited into God's story, and He's going to bless you and He's going to challenge you. But the reason I showed it is that I hope you start to see why this is important. Does that make sense? You're going to start to learn about who God is. You're going to start to learn what he wants for your life. You're going to learn how to handle some challenges as one of his children. And hopefully you're going to start to see that he's got things in control. Make sense? Any questions? 
Anything at all. Alright. Is there anything I can pray for y'all yeah. as we close up? Like I said, <coughs> I may not be up on lingo, but I can guarantee that each one of you had or has different things going on. Would anybody like to pray for something? Anybody else? Yeah. Um, a baby horse. Baby horse. All right. Let's go ahead and pray, guys. <clears throat> Dear God, once again, we give you thanks for, for this time to be together. And we give you thanks that you are a loving God who is active in our lives. That you speak to us. That you show us where we make mistakes, how it is you want us to live our lives, but ultimately that you show us we are loved and that we are redeemed. Lord, I pray for all these youth here. Uh, help them to find comfort in the things they're going to learn. Uh, help them see that you are the hero of the story. Help them to see the likeness in that, that they can go out, they can be your child, that they do not need to be the hero to make sure that all things are in hand because you have all things in hand. Lord, I want to uh, give you thanks and hope for the meeting with Bree and her mom that they haven't been able to talk in a year. I hope that time together is, is good. Lord, we pray for our families. Uh, be with them as we are away. That time can be uh, difficult, anxiety-inducing, but we know that you are our great protector. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would be uh, with Sway's uh, baby horse. Uh, heal it if that is your will, Lord, and uh, help them move. The transition to a new home be a good one. And Lord, as we go out from here, uh, we have our, our fun time together and our devotional time. Help us to go back to our, our uh, places of safety tonight, to sleep, to be rejuvenated so that we might come back and learn more about you and who we are as your children. All this we ask in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. You can pack up your stuff and you can actually leave it right here because we're going to <coughs> be coming back here. Thanks. Wait, should we leave our Bibles? Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.